Uh, Revelation 4.1 does not speak of a rapture. John does not represent a rapture. He's caught up in heaven to see uh, future events that are going to happen. You say, yeah, but, but, but the elders there, that represents the church. And Revelation 5, they're already redeemed in heaven. Yeah, thousands have already died. Thousands have already been killed. Of course, they're believers in heaven already. But where does it speak anywhere in these chapters of believers being taken up to heaven? It doesn't. Just John's caught up to see a vision. That's it. Take, take the words for what they say. Again, last trumpet, we've now heard that the last trumpet is not really the last trumpet because there's a significant trumpet. Just focus on Matthew 24 that follows it. We're also told that there are now two trumpet sounds that we have to imagine. <clears throat> Go with it where you want. So also all of you who have believed that will suddenly just be taken out secretly and no one sees that coming, that's not what Pastor Derek believes. So it's going to be a public event that everybody sees and hears, but then we'll be gone. All right. So all that you see in the Left Behind series, the, the movies, that's not what he's teaching and believing. So just to clarify that. OK, uh, the idea that flood equals tribulation, that's false. Uh, as it was in the days of Noah, people just going about their business. Then what happens? What's the point? The whole point there is then sudden destruction came, not not a period of seven years where the destruction gets worse and worse. That's the point. All right. That's number one. Number two. Uh, in Revelation 11, after the fall, the two witnesses are killed, the people are rejoicing and they're giving gifts and celebrating. And over and over in Revelation, it says no matter what's being poured out, the people refuse to repent. So they were going on living lives as normal as they could. But Paul's explicit about it. First Thessalonians, the fifth chapter, that when people are saying peace and safety, that's when sudden destruction comes. And how does he describe it? Sudden destruction on the world. As for the idea that there is a rapture that does not have clear signs and then a second coming with clear signs, well, that's totally false because Jesus gives signs. And in Luke 21, when you see these things happening, know that your redemption is near. He gives the signs. Pastor Orkin admit, in his book admits their signs. I can give exact quotes, but just not as clear as the signs of the second coming. No, they're, they're all describing the same event. Remember, Paul says that day will not overtake you like a thief. Revelation 16, in the midst of tribulation and wrath, Jesus says, I come like a thief. 2 Peter 3, the day of the Lord comes like a thief. And that's the time of final destruction and judgment that's being spoken of there. So people will be deceived. 2 Thessalonians 2, a spirit of strong delusion is poured out on people because they believe a lie. They choose to believe a lie. So of course they're going to be in denial. All right. So when we press the no analogy correctly, we come out with the exact opposite conclusion. The idea that there was an any moment rapture that the early church believed in is, is absolutely bogus. Again, overwhelming. And I look at three different doctoral dissertations that study this, as well as uh, others that focused on it. The early church leaders taught consistently that we'll be here during a time of Antichrist. It'll be a time of fierce persecution and then Jesus will return. Paul is explicit that the parousia that we are waiting for is the parousia when Jesus destroys the Antichrist, when he comes in flaming fire, taking vengeance on those that don't know God. But just think of this. Acts 1.6, when the disciples ask Jesus, are you at this time going to restore the kingdom to Israel? He says, hey, it's not for you to know the times and seasons which the Father is appointed by his own authority, but, verse 8, you'll receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you, and you'll be my witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, to the ends of the earth. In other words, they've got a job to do, this commission. They didn't think, oh, he can come any second. No, he just told them he's not coming any second. So they live with expectation, readiness, the sense he's at the door. And certainly all of us know that we could die at any moment. So we live in readiness before the Lord. But, but, but think of this with me. They were given a great commission. So they knew he couldn't come in any second. Peter in, in, in Acts 3 says explicitly that he must remain in heaven. Jesus must remain in heaven until the time of the restoration of all things. So there is a time and season for his coming, and there must be Jewish repentance first. Paul speaks of that in Romans, the 11th chapter, the requirement of Jewish repentance first before we get to that point of life from the dead. Not only so, but Jesus told Peter what was going to happen to him as an old man and how he was going to be crucified. So the idea that they believe Jesus come in a second, totally false. Paul, or, or excuse me, the author of Hebrews in Hebrews 10 says, you should exhort one another daily, daily all the more as you see the day approaching, all the more as you see the day approaching. Well, 
what if you don't see the day approach? In other words, there are signs, there are indications that it's getting closer and closer. And let's just say Israel will be back in the land if Pastor Derek believes that's the fig tree Jesus was speaking of. Well, then until Israel was back in the land, then Jesus couldn't return. So uh, that, again, is, is also important to emphasize. And I want to say this once more. The idea that, you know, parousia and epiphania and apocalypse that they, they can't refer to the rapture. Uh, first, I defy Pastor Derek with gentleness and grace to teach on this and just use biblical vocabulary. We're looking forward to the parousia and then after that, the parousia. First, there'll be the epiphania and then the epiphania. You must use different words or create new words like disappearance that are nowhere found in the New Testament, in the Bible. You must create these concepts to communicate. And, the, uh, and if you want a simple refutation, just go through Matthew 24 and ask, who is Jesus addressing? Who is he speaking to? Because you actually have to change audiences to make this work. Well, no, this is the Jewish elect. No, this is the church. And, no, the, and, and within a few verses of each other, to speak of the identical words and the identical events, say they're two separate ones, becomes a council of despair. Um, let's just see. The idea we're not appointed to wrath, Paul's explicit what he's talking, to, uh, talking about. It is, it is the wrath of the second coming, final judgment, and the wrath of eternal judgment. That's what we're not appointed to. The idea that we're not appointed to a period on a few, a few years on the earth where the wrath of God is poured out is completely bogus. Completely bogus. Not what he's talking about. He's explicit. When the world is saying peace and safety, then sudden destruction comes on them. What's he talking about? The return of Jesus, the culmination of the age, flaming fire, taking vengeance on those that don't know God. When that happens, when that happens, judgment will come on the earth, but that won't happen to you. Why? Because that day won't overtake you as a thief because you're going to be here when it happens, but it won't overtake you as a thief because your eyes will be opened. And not only will your eyes be open, the fact is you're not appointed to wrath. Therefore, that will not be for you. And where there are judgments in the world and they've been poured out through eternity, God knows how to keep his own. And I just have to ask forthrightly, are you telling me that almighty God cannot pour out his wrath on the earth and yet seal his people so that they are not touched? Are you telling me that that's impossible according to the Bible? And that when the book of Revelation talks about God's servants sealed and protected, that, that it doesn't mean what it says? So I would really challenge those points very, very strongly. And again, the idea that you can just start counting. Okay, we got 1,290 days to go. People debate all kinds of issues now. People date set wrongly all the time. I've got emails from people. Do you think now we're in the tribulation? Is this the beginning of birth pangs? The idea that you're suddenly going to be able to say, okay, it just started here. We get the clock ticking and we know the exact number of days is bogus. Even the endless numbers of interpretations about the meaning of the days and how they work out and other days in the book of Daniel that we don't understand exactly how they're going to unfold. The idea that we're going to get that perfectly right. And then what about the idea that the days could be shortened? So we will know the time is near. We will know the judge is at the door. We will know that this is the culmination. It's not going to be like, whoop, zip, zip, we're out of here. What just happened? You know, God's driving his car and you're a taxi driver and you're in the back seat and suddenly he's gone. It's, no, that's not what's going to happen. At the culmination of the age, as God has been working and preparing and readying his people for all of these things to take place, the world will be in confusion. The world will be in denial. The world will be in blasphemy. The world will be in darkness. And people will still be saying peace and safety. We will know it's near. We don't know the day or the hour. But we will know it's near our, our, we are ready, we are expecting, and then the great sound, we're caught up to meet him. And before the whole world watches, we descend with him as he sets up his kingdom on the earth and we enjoy the marriage supper of the Lamb. Pastor Walker, uh, you will be uh, first to cross-examine Dr. Brown. and You can ask him uh, any questions that you have, and uh, you'll have a 10-minute period where you can uh, cross-examine him, and you can begin now. I do. I just need to be clarify. I think uh, Dr. Brown mis misunderstood. I didn't say that when the rapture happens, the whole world will see it. I, I was simply saying that it's a massive public event because, let's say, a billion people will see it, but not the unbelievers. Whether it will be heard or not is another issue. All right. Um, Dr. Brown, I'm interested in uh, your view on the Daniel 70 70th week 
I'll just quickly read it uh, in the NIV. He will confirm a covenant with many for one seven. In the middle of the seven, he'll put an end to sacrifice and offering. And at the temple, he will set up an abomination that causes desolation until the end that is decreed is poured out on him. So I'm just interested. Do you believe that Daniel's 70th week has already been fulfilled in Uh, the first century? uh, Yes, most likely I do uh, for the following reasons. Uh, First, Daniel is given a revelation in Daniel, the ninth chapter, as he's praying for the return from exile. About 70 years, God says, no, there's a much more important period of 70 times 7, 490 years. And this is what's going to happen during the time of the second temple. And it it emphasizes how atonement will be made and everlasting righteousness ushered in and things like that. So I see it first in response to Daniel's prayer. Uh, Second thing is that you can make an excellent case for that uh, uh, time period, you just have a gap of from the, the coming of Jesus until that time of just about 40 years, so it's, it's not a, a gap of 2,000 years. Um, and what, ha- what we do know, the Romans did break covenant and sacrifice and offering were ceased with the uh, stop with the destruction of the temple. And we also know that the, the Jewish believers in Jerusalem, when they saw these things happening, they did what Jesus said. They thought this is what he was referring to, and they fled uh, to Pella, etc., et So they seem to understand that was the case, and I believe that's the best and most likely reading of it. I I agree that, um, you know, Luke 21 does talk about the Pella situation, but the the Matthew 24 seems to be different. But how would you then explain the fact that Jesus references Daniel's 70 weeks in talking about the end-time tribulation when— you, when you see the abomination of desolation that Daniel talked about, then you need to flee. And, and, and the narrative is continuous leading up to the second coming. Right. So uh, Matthew 24, uh, I understand, as many other Old Testament prophecies, which is it, it has a first reference and a final reference. Like Ezekiel 36, the Jewish people coming out of exile in Babylon, there was the immediate fulfillment, but it, it didn't exhaust everything that was there. Now there's the final fulfillment as we see Jewish people being regathered in unbelief back to the land. So Matthew 24, I see is kind of layered. We all would on a certain level, unless we're, we're full preterists, so that there is a fulfillment in the first century because uh, he, he's, they're answering, they're asking the question, uh, when will this happen, the destruction of the temple? What will be the sign of your coming of the end of the age? So he's answering that. And then he's also answering with his final return. So uh, I, I am not averse to the possibility that there is a dual fulfillment of Daniel 7, 70th week, as there is a dual fulfillment of Matthew 24. In other words, destruction of Jerusalem in the year 70 and final destruction at the end with final coming. Uh, so first a coming in judgment and then a coming for his, for his saints. Uh, I'm not averse to that possibility. I just don't see it as the most natural reading of the text. So First and foremost, he is telling us what's going to happen in the year 70, and then he's also telling us, kind of layered right behind it, what's going to happen when he returns at the end of the age. So you you kind of see there could be a a double fulfillment of Daniel's 70th week. It's a a possibility, sir. Yeah. And and, and you accept Daniel 12, 11, you know, the 1,290 days is talking about the end times. It, It seems to be, but if we press Daniel 12... It's also telling us that, that the resurrection we're, we're waiting for happens at the end of, of, of the period uh, spoken of. But even if, even if I accepted a literal 1290 days, and I think you have to be very, very careful, just like Daniel was praying about a literal 70 years, and God said, actually, there's more to the story. There's, there's 490 years, 70 times seven. The same way with Daniel's 1290 days, I'm not going to be dogmatic about that. But bottom line, even if it is talking about a period of time, what we don't know is the day or the hour. So we should know it's getting close. But the idea that I can just say, okay, it started today. I mean, surely you know with all your, your prophecy teaching how many times people misinterpret the signs or, or think something's wrong. So the idea we can just start, okay, this is the moment this happened. We got 1,290 days. What if those days are shortened? But we should know when we're getting really close to the end. It, it shouldn't be hit or miss, but we just don't know the day or the hour. Pre, pre-tribbers do uh, strong to interpret the Bible literally, and I would agree with that. And particularly with my mass background, um, you know, numbers are very important to me. Um, so, do you you seem to have a kind of you're not sure really whether the one thousand two hundred sixty days, the three and a half times, the forty two months, if if that's just spiritual spiritualized language or 
are these literal periods of time. If we're going to the book of Revelation, we know it's spiritualized language throughout. I mean, unless we think the devil is seven heads and ten horns and things like that, that there are all kinds of images. I mean, we know it's apocalyptic literature, for sure. And we also know it had to have relevance for the early church, because that's first and foremost uh, to whom it was written. So there may be final antichrist, which I believe, but then application believers would have seen to, to someone like a, a Nero. So if, if you are saying there's going to be a literal fulfillment of everything literally in the book of Revelation, I would tell you it's a complete misreading of the book of Revelation. I would tell you that all ancient readers would understand this is apocalyptic literature and they would accordingly know how to read it. Just like when you have a dream, the dream needs interpretation. And that's why to this moment, you have scholars saying, no, all of Revelation is past. No, all of Revelation is spiritual. No, all of Revelation is future because of the mystery of the symbolism. But even if I said, fine, take every day, literally, fine, just every, that's literal numbers of days. Although there's still some passages in Daniel, I don't, I don't know that are, are, are going to be perfectly clear when, when he lists the other, uh, other lists of days here. I just don't want to get into that in, in too much detail. I'm, I'm happy to, if you want, but He's got the 1,290 days, but then he also has blessed is he who waits and arrives at the 1,335 days. I've heard so many different interpretations, but fine. Let's say it's literal 1,290 days. Fine. Okay. I accept it. The idea that everyone on the earth is going to be able to know that's exactly what happened and believers will be able to set their clock for it. The fact that I'm asked constantly about times and dates and are we in the tribulation now or did it start or what? It reminds me of how wrong we can be in our date setting. So even if I accept it as literal 1290 days, literal three, three and a half year period, whatever, doesn't affect anything I've said. I, I think there is a difference between the present time because we do not have a plain statement of scripture saying, you know, the, when the Lord's coming um, or the rapture's coming. But in the tribulation, they have a plain statement of scripture that it's going to take so many days. You know, even in Daniel 12, 7, it talks about, you know, the, the angel actually lifts his both hands to heaven, actually, and swears by God that it's going to be 1,260 days. It seems to me that you have to take that literally. So how do you square that with when Jesus basically said, you know, be ready for the Son of Man is coming at an hour you do not expect? But in other words, not only do you don't know when it's going to happen, you don't know when it's not going to happen. It, it could happen any time. But, but Jesus tells us that that day will not overtake us as a thief. In other words, unless you're listening to him, it will be at an hour that you don't expect. But he's already told us what to expect. He's told us when you see these things, lift up your eyes for your redemption draws near. Again, First Thessalonians 5, that day won't overtake you as a thief. So unless he gave us sufficient indication, then that day would overtake us as, as a thief. Uh, not only so, look, you've got 1,260 days, then we've got 1,290 days, and we've got 1,335 days. I would say that there is ambiguity there in, in any case, and then the possibility of what Jesus says in Matthew 24, those days being shortened. So we're not going to know the day or the hour, but we're going to know it's very, very close. And, and again, I, I, I don't, if you want to press the 1260 days, then press the 1290, then press the 1335, three different sets already, press the fact that Jesus said that you will know, you will know the time. So it's going to come on you at an unexpected time if you live like the world. So open your eyes, listen carefully, and it won't hit you at an unexpected time. The fact that the church with pre-tribbers are constantly wondering, is it, is it going to happen now? Did Jesus come any second? Did I miss it? You know, I, I, I forgot to set my clock differently. I went to church at the wrong time. There was no one there. I thought I missed the rapture. Indicates how much confusion that the teaching can actually bring and rather than bringing clarity, it brings all this guesswork and endless books being written about when Jesus is coming back. And, and of course, the dates are always having to change and be revised b because of the, the misunderstanding. Dr. Brown, you now have 10 minutes to cross-examine Pastor Walker. Yeah, so Pastor Walker, first, again, thank you so much for being willing to do this. And thank you for your spirit. And thank you for your, your evident love for the Lord in the midst of it. And, and I'm glad we could, we could be feisty and honest and <laughs> this. All right, so I got no reply at any point to 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, where Paul speaks of the parousia and says that we, the believers, the persecuted church, will receive relief when Jesus comes in flaming fire, taking vengeance on those who don't know God. That's when he'll be glorified among us. 
So could you please explain that? Sure. I I was hoping to because it still was just a matter of time that I couldn't address it. But um, it it is an it is a, a powerful passage, and uh, I would say the post trib argument depends on the particular interpretation of the word rest in in verse seven, where it says, uh, you know, to to give you who are troubled rest with us when the Lord Jesus is revealed from heaven. And, um, and of course, you would assume that that means the ending of the persecution against the Thessalonians, um, and, and therefore it's a, a reference to the rapture when it says that God will give, us, give them rest from that persecution. Um, you know, but that's plausible, but Paul and the Thessalonians didn't find that kind of rest from their persecutors at the rapture, rather when they died. I think there's a better interpretation of that word, which means relief and relaxation from a state of tension. And it's talking about um, when a crime has been committed against you, for example, or a loved one, and you've been falsely accused of evil. Even when you're in the place of safety, you're still under tension until public justice is done and you're vindicated uh, and, and then the guilty are punished. And, you know, we see that in Revelation 6, you know, with the, the souls, the martyrs under the altar. And, and they are vexed, you know, how long, Lord, until you judge and avenge our blood. And so even though they're safe, they're still in a state of tension. And then they're told they should rest a little while longer until the martyrdoms are completed. And so what's going on here is not the ending of the persecution, but the relief when public justice is actually done. And I believe if you look at the whole context of that passage, it's really talking about the righteous judge taking judicial action to repay the guilty of, and their punishment and repay the righteous. And of course, as you know, it's the same word repay is used to talk about God's punishment of the wicked and his vindication of the righteous. It's it's a legal terminology. He will repay with tribulation those who trouble you, and he will repay those who are troubled w with rest. And so what I'm saying, I would say, is yes, it is indeed the second coming, uh, but it's talking about his public vengeance on the wicked. And uh, and it's all about vindication, because primarily the public vindication of Christ, because he's had many evil things spoken against him. He suffered great persecution and abuse uh, through his himself and through his church. And so only when he appears at the second coming in glory will he receive his public vindication that he is who he claimed to be. And we will be part of that because we'll be on display, you know, because it says in that day he'll be glorified in his saints and admired in all those who believe. And so we will be displayed as trophies of his grace to an awestruck world. So basically, I believe it's about the public display of divine justice and vindication at the second coming. And it, it's not about the rapture at all. All right. So I would point out that you constantly have to use the word rapture, 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 rapture to separate it from the, the words that are used over and over and over and over. So uh, the word rapture, how many times would you say, if I can get a quick answer to this, the Greek equivalent of the word rapture, how many times is that found explicitly in the New Testament with reference to the subject we're talking about? We're talking about harpazo, you mean, in Thessalonians. Mm-hmm. I mean, that, that's that, that's it. I mean, but that's what so, we do with theology. I could say, you know, how many times? Uh, right, but no, if, if I go, if I think is, is the word Trinity in the Bible, you know, that that's right. We use certain theological labels. The, the point so, I'm making so is the, the, point, the point I'm making is that Paul explicitly does not. Paul explicitly res, res, speaks over and over of the parousia, over and over of the epiphania, the apocalypsis. These are the words used. Jesus speaks of these words as as well. And yet the only way you can make sense of this is to not use biblical vocabulary. So I would just challenge you at a future presentation to just use biblical vocabulary throughout the way it's used. But we know that we're waiting for his appearing, that we're all, all longing for his appearing. And then we see in 2 Thessalonians 2 that Paul speaks about the coming of the Lord, where he will destroy the Antichrist, speaks of that coming of the Lord at the beginning of, of the second chapter of Second Thessalonians, but says that day will not come till the apostasy comes first and the man of lawlessness is revealed. Uh, let me just quote this to you from Professor, uh, from Anthony Hopkins 
Um, of the 15 occurrences of the feminine noun apostasia, five from the Greek Old Testament, three from the Apocrypha, two from the New Testament, two from the Papyra, and three from Josephus, all 15 refer to religious departure or apostasy, rebellion, or revolt. Are you saying that every major lexicon, uh, every major tr uh, translation that translates with apostasy or rebellion and a, a 400-year window of Greek material, that they're all wrong and that does not mean apostasy there? Um, yeah, I see you've read my book. <laughs> the, I, I would say on the Thessalonian passage, first of all, that where we would primarily differ is that is on the definition of the day of the Lord, because you would assume the day of the Lord is the second coming in verse two. I would say that's impossible because the whole passage would be would be nonsense because you know, if they're if they're worried that the day of the Lord had come, it's obvious the day of the Lord hadn't come if it's the climatic coming of the Lord in power and glory. The whole thing would be a nonsense. But to answer your specific question, yes, it is a minority view that the falling away, the apostasia, um, even among pre-tribbers, is 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 a departure. But I'm personally convinced of that case because, first of all, of course, it it, it was you the, this word apostasia. Uh, can mean a physical departure or a spiritual departure. In the original English translations, based on Jerome originally, it was translated departure, which leaves open the possibility it's a physical one as well as a, or a spiritual one. Uh, in classical Greek, Liddell Scott does say it's a possible usage is the physical. The verbal equivalent is the majority use is physical. Um, Agreed. In the Koine Greek, the majority use is spiritual, um, but there is one uh, use that's physical. Um, in Archimedes, the the Sandrechner, he uses it in a physical way, and that's Koine Greek. And in the in the Patristic Greek afterwards, again, it's used in a physical way. In the Lamps uh, lexicon, it actually is used to describe a rapture event in the kind of fifth century Assumption of Mary. So. What you have is a word that does have that physical possibility as well, from the classical Greek all the th way through the Koine Greek and through the thing, although admittedly it's not the primary use in the Koine Greek. But when it says the departure comes first, you know. And the man of sin will be revealed. Yeah, and before, the man of sin is revealed. Before the, the coming the, of our Lord Jesus, concerning the coming well, of our again, Lord Jesus Christ say, and our being gathered together to him, this will not happen until the apostasy, which, of course, overwhelmingly the evidence is against your position there, as, as, as you know. Uh, but the man of sin must also oh, be really? revealed. This has to happen before we're being gathered to the Lord. Paul's explicit. First of all, let me just say that when it says um, falling away departure, it doesn't specify what it is. So I would say that the law is, to, rather than prejudge it, uh, if it within the verbal range, do, if it does include physical, then look in the context to see what the departure is. And there is a very specific departure because verse one tells us that the rapture is the subject under discussion. And so I would say it's it's natural to say that the departure comes first before, again, the day of the Lord with the tribulation, not the not the thing. And then it says the man of sin is revealed. Now, the man of sin being revealed is the first event within the day of the Lord, within the tribulation. And that's how it can read, because it says the apostasia comes first. And then the man of sin is revealed. In other words, that's the first event of the tribulation. So he's saying, you know you're not in the tribulation because the apostasia says the apostasia hasn't happened yet, whatever that is. And then also because the Antichrist hasn't been revealed. And if you were in the tribulation, the Antichrist would be revealed. So I believe that reading of it is consistent. And it's confirmed by later in the passage where it talks about the restrainer being being removed and, and then the man of sin is revealed. So it, that harmonizes very nicely. Pastor Walker, to cross-examine Dr. Brown one last time, and you can begin now. Okay, I guess um, I'd like to take us to Revelation 19 mm -hmm. and 20. And um, in Revelation 19, of course, we see Christ return uh, in power and glory. He defeats the Antichrist. And um, and then, I, I, first of all, I don't quite understand how you explain the fact that that it seems that the bride is already in heaven before 
the return of Christ? The bride is not in heaven. The bride's here on earth. The saints are mentioned, Revelation 13, 7, Revelation 13, 10, Revelation 13, 12, Revelation 14, 12, Revelation 16, 6, Revelation 17, 6, Revelation 18, 20, which also includes the apostles here on earth being killed. And then 19, 8. So we're, bride is, is here on earth. There is no hint that the bride is anywhere else. Bride's been here the whole time. So you think it's a coincidence, really, that uh, it talks about the, these, this bride that's dressed um, in the white robes, bright and clean. Then the armies of heaven have exactly the same clothing following Christ on the way down. That's a kind of coincidence. Well, suddenly we've become the armies of, of heaven uh, throughout the Bible. Adonai Tzvaot, the Lord of armies, is talking about the armies of angels. So did they just get displaced? Did hundreds of references to God... Uh, the armies of heaven and, and his angelic uh, uh, warriors, did they just get displaced by the church? No, we know for a fact, but what we both agree on is that when Jesus returns after the tribulation, that he's coming with his angels. And we know elsewhere, angels, you know, in these shining garments. So now the, the, the church also gets to be clothed the same way as the angels coming down from, from heaven. But the bride is here on earth. I just gave a bunch of references indicating that with the specific New Testament emphasis calling us saints and even referencing apostles being here on the earth. So that's indisputably uh, a New Testament reference to believers here. And the armies of heaven, you know, go through the rest of the Bible. Who do we know is coming when Jesus returns? The angels. How, how are they described elsewhere as part of his armies? So Jesus comes with the armies of heaven with his angelic armies, and now we, the church, will be also clothed in white, just as the armies of heaven. Yeah, it's not coincidence. It's a beautiful picture. Okay. Um, I think we both agree that there isn't a second chance to be saved after death. Um, do you think the same is true about the second coming, that you can't be saved after Jesus has come in his power and glory? Uh, yes, correct. Well, yeah. unless we want to argue about the subject of salvation in the millennial kingdom, because we both believe there'll be a millennial kingdom, unless yeah. we want to discuss that, which I think is a separate subject. But no, that yeah, the just, second coming, uh, it's not like you're going to be able to say, you know, I got it wrong. Can we get a replay here? No, that'll no. be a, a final right. judgment. Yeah. So you probably know where I'm going with this, but um, who are the sheep in the judgment of the sheep and the goats, which it says when the Son of Man comes in his glory? Uh, he'll sit on the throne of his glory and all, all nations will be gathered to him and he'll separate the sheep from the goats. So who are these sheep? Yeah, so first it's talking about nations, not people. So I don't think you believe in national salvation, that some nations go to heaven no, and no, some I nations agree. go to heaven. Right. All the Gentile nations, yeah. Right, so it's Matthew 25, 31 to 46. It could, it could well be a parable with the whole point being the, the importance of, of caring for the, the poor and the needy, the least of these among his brothers, the persecuted saints. Some would say it's persecuted Jews it's talking about. But the contrast at the end, uh, according to what you would believe, is that some will go into the, <clears throat> the millennial kingdom and others will go to hell, and yet it says e eternal life versus eternal punishment. So to press this as, in terms of salvation, it would also be a matter of salvation by, by works, it would seem, that if you showed compassion to the poor and the needy among God's people, that you, you have eternal life, and if not, you go to hell forever. So that would seem to be contrary to teaching salvation through the blood. So I, I look at this as an ethical teaching and, and perhaps even a parable. By the way, Steve, your mic, I think, is on, just giving some background noise there. But um, in, in any case, uh, yeah, if, if you want to press this literally, then it under, uh, under, undercuts foundations of, of the gospel and it, it, uh, <clears throat> it undercuts other aspects of salvation. So <clears throat> if, if, if I wanted to understand this in a little different way, I would go to Zechariah 14 which speaks of the survivors of the, the survivors of the nations that attacked Jerusalem. So when he returns, he will destroy those attacking Jerusalem in, in the final battle. But it could be that in different nations, there were those who were not saved, but who were merciful and compassionate towards persecuted Christians and persecuted Jews. And they are the ones that enter the millennial kingdom, in which case eternal life, eternal punishment is not necessarily talking about fully eternal, but just for the uh, the distant future, namely the coming blessing in the millennial kingdom. 
But however you press it, I think you're going to have as many issues or problems as I would. I, I think there are many scriptures that would say that unbelievers are not allowed into the millennium kingdom, that, you know, that, that they are removed. And I would say the sheep are, are believers and they've shown their faith by their works, you know, um, and they are the ones that enter. And the, the, prob the post trip problem, of course, is that um, all these sheep will have been raptured uh, when Christ came. Um, and therefore, there won't be any sheep left. And all the goats, of course, aren't allowed into the kingdom. So you basically got nobody who can enter the millennium kingdom. And I think this is a. Um, a, a pr big problem for the post trip view. I can't see how one can get around that. Well, then if we go through your view, then this is what's going to happen to some of these believers. This is the millennial kingdom, Zechariah 14, <clears throat> verse 12. And this shall be the plague with which the Lord will strike all the peoples that wage war against Jerusalem, their flesh. So he goes through all that. Then uh, it, it goes on to say, Verse 16, then everyone who survives of all the nations that have come against Jerusalem shall go up year to year to worship the king, the Lord of hosts, and to keep the feast of booths. And if any of the families, so you're saying these are all believers, right? If any of the families of the well, earth do I, not I, go I up to Jerusalem to worship the king, the Lord of hosts, there will be no rain on them. And if the family of Egypt does not go up and present themselves, then on them there shall be no rain. There's, this shall be the plague which the Lord afflicts the nations that do not go up to keep the Feast of Booths. So they're obviously not all believers. They're the ones that, that were not complicit in the attack on Jerusalem. This, this actually makes sense of the text. That's why there's still disobedience in the millennial kingdom. And that's why at the end of it, in Revelation 20, Satan leads masses of people in rebellion against God. If they're eternally saved believers, who is he leading in rebellion against God? So your view actually is completely contradicted by Zechariah 14 and Revelation 20. It's not really a problem for our view because we would say that all the, you know, at the start of the millennium, everyone's believers, but they, of course, will have children. There'll be a population explosion. And in due time in the millennium, there, there will be rebels and so forth. And obviously at the end, we see that. So that isn't really a, a, a major problem. But those, um, those entering the millennium, though, it says that they receive eternal life. So you're saying they're not resurrected. Well, I, I believe they'll be raptured at the end of the millennium. All right, but but so they have eternal life, but then they have children that end up in rebellion. But interestingly, if any of the families that do not go up to worship to Jerusalem to worship the king, you have to wait for your population explosion. It doesn't say there's a population explosion. They're going to go up year to well, year, and if they fail to, judgment's going to come. I mean, you have you have to read things in here that are absolutely not explicit in the text. Well, the text doesn't doesn't talk. It just describes the millennium generally, you know. So. Is, is there time for one more question? Uh, you can ask. I'll try to answer quick. <laughs> no, I'm, yes, I'm you just... have a minute and a half. All right. Then. Um, Revelation 20, of course, talks about the, um, the tribulation martyrs being resurrected. And it, but it seems that that happens after Christ has returned. He's destroyed the Antichrist. He then locks Satan up for a thousand years. And then he resurrects the tribulation martyrs. But whereas it would seem that... Um, that's the wrong timing because they should have been uh, wrapped, resurrected with uh, as part of the uh, the the first phase, as it were, of the second coming. Uh, and so it seems that the timing is off there. And why are they resurrected as a separate group? Right. I, I don't believe they because are resurrected. Part of the church. Yeah, I, I, I don't believe that they are resurrected as a separate group because it speaks of the first resurrection. So there's only one first resurrection, and that takes place when Jesus returns. So I, I believe it's just like Genesis 1 and 2, you have the overview laid out, and then you get more specific, and you can think the days are out of order, but no, it's just here's the larger view, and this is the telescopic view. So unless you believe in, in three resurrections when there are only two spoken of, no, this is, this is all a description of what happens. So this, this is part of what's taking place. Those killed during the tribulation we uh, and and those dead in Christ, we meet the Lord together in the air when He recom comes. That's the first resurrection. Doctor Brown, you now have ten minutes to cross-examine Pastor Walker. Yeah, let me let me just say that the scariest scenario would not be that we suddenly all disappear and Pastor Walker was right, but that Pastor Walker disappears and the rest of us are still here. That would be the the scary scenario. Okay, in, in all in all seriousness, uh, let let me press the the argument that the New Testament believers thought that Jesus could come at, at any moment. So, Pastor Walker, what of 
Acts 1, 6 through 8 that I read in the Great Commission, and then Acts 3, where Peter says he must remain in heaven until. Uh, do you think that the first believers literally thought Jesus could come at any moment, or did they understand that they had a great commission that they were to go about fulfilling? On the Acts 3 one, I would say about Jesus going into heaven until the time of the restoration of all things, I would say that he left, he leaves heaven. The restoration of all things actually begins in the tribulation because the last prophecy, Malachi, you know, of the Old Testament is that Elijah will come first and restore all things. So the restoration begins in the tribulation, which, of course, primarily is restoring um, the, the Jews to their faith. Um, and that will happen before the great and awesome day of the Lord. Um, as for the other the issues against imminency, um, what I would say first is a blanket statement that, for instance, Jesus said, I'm coming at a time when you don't expect me. That, in a sense, is designed to humble all our kind of reasonings and rationalizations why he can't come now or, or whenever. And so, in a sense, Although we can come up with with certain difficult scenarios, I, I still think we we need to humble ourselves under Jesus' statement there, which basically says, "You you 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 don't know." Um, now, I would also say yes, with one or two of those, you know, X one eight, the in a, in the first year after making that statement, it would seem unlikely that he would come at that time. And, uh, but these uh, kind of examples are really only apply very early on um, in church history. Um, already in Colossians, Paul says that, you know, the gospel's gone, you know, around the world. Um, and I would also say, you know, for instance, it's, it says, uh, you know, you can allow certain exceptions to certain general statements of doctrine because, for instance, it says it's appointed unto man once to die and after that the judgment. Well, of course, that's generally true, but it's easy enough to to find exceptions to that statement. So I don't think if you can conjure up the odd uh, exception to imminency like Peter's death and so on, um, that that negates the doctrine entirely. In fact, when it when it comes to the writing of Scripture, you know, in AD 45 onwards or whatever, then you, you, you know, imminency is, is, is established. So as far as we're concerned, uh, imminency holds. And I believe we have to submit to Jesus's statement there that we, we just don't know. Therefore, it could happen any time. Right. So you take the one statement we just don't know uh, against the scores well, of statements series, giving right, us indication right. of, of times, etc. Okay. You wrote in your book, so in any case, you you would agree that the very first disciples immediately were not expecting at any moment rapture. Well, uh, you, all I'm saying is that that is a rationalization that I can't answer easily, you, you know. Okay, fine. But, um, all right, so let me, uh, in your book you wrote, so Jesus compares the signs to trees which are fully developed and bearing fruit in the summer. When you see them all blossoming and putting forth leaves together in the spring, you know that summer is near. Likewise, since we know the various world conditions in which the tribulation, the trees in their fully developed form, we can know we when we are in the time just before the tribulation, for they cannot become, got the rest of the quote missing there. In, in any case, your point is. Yeah, yeah. I that, was hoping you wouldn't ask me this. Yeah. So <laughs> you're saying that the tribulation I, is the fully developed trees, but before that, we see the trees developing. So we can actually see, and he's telling us, okay, this is how you know it's getting closer. So yeah. if. If those things are not anywhere developed, then we know it's not getting closer. I need to explain myself, and uh, and I apologize because I've actually changed my view on that position as we do refine our beliefs over time. Um, I've come to see now that the transition point is verse 36, and when he was talking about the fig tree and all the trees, technically in the passage he's, he's still talking about the signs of the the second coming. And therefore... It was possible that that the you know that restoration of Israel, for instance, would happen as part of the tribulation. Because I don't necessarily believe the tribulation is limited to seven years. It's simply that Daniel's seventieth week is the last seven years. So, as Jesus presented it, there wasn't a contradiction with imminency. Now we have the advantage of events happening, and now we can see that the fig tree uh, has happened before the tribulation and therefore what he applies i do believe that still is true but it was at the time of writing jesus didn't set it up as a 
contradiction to imminency, nam namely Israel's rebirth, because that could have happened after the rapture. Right. So uh, I, I apologize. I, I need to rewrite that, that section. All right. Hey, listen, I'm here to help you. Maybe we'll help get some <laughs> other sections rewritten. Okay, so just to, pre <laughs> just to press this, all right? Again, uh, uh, Hebrews urges us to exhort one another daily, all the more as you see the day approaching. So there are certainly times in history when we don't see the day approaching. So if we're not seeing the day approaching, that would indicate that another generation sees it more clearly and therefore can be more ready. Uh, are you just saying it's a level thing throughout church history that Jesus could come at any moment and that if you're astute and looking at Scripture and looking at the signs of the times, that you'll know equally he could come at any moment? Are there not times when it seems clearer that he's closer than others? I would say from the way Jesus put it that he wanted the church to be constantly looking for his coming. And, and, and in a sense, the, the doctrine of imminency is a doctrine of Im ignorance. It's basically saying you don't know. And if you think you know, you don't know. I'll come when you don't expect me. And therefore, it keeps us on our toes, as it were, looking for his imminent coming. Uh, I would say personally that as church history has gone on, especially in the last century, we do see lots of signs. We do see the fig tree and the trees. And therefore, that, that does give us extra you know, belief that, uh, you know, it, it could happen at any time. But it's always been true, I believe. And I think the early church uh, did believe in imminency, and they, and they lived that way. So depressed, you know, Paul mentions the gospel has been preached to every creature under heaven. Does he mean to every human being or just all kinds of people all over have heard it because he's burning to get the gospel to places where it's never been. And Matthew 24 says this gospel of the kingdom must be preached as a witness to all nations and then the end will come. Uh, are you saying that the New Testament writers actually thought that they had fulfilled the Great Commission? No. All I'm saying is that, you know, we know that the the, the the, the, the Lord of the harvest is is waiting for uh, his complete harvest, the fullness of the Gentiles. Uh, but all I'm saying is, is we don't have that knowledge as when he considers the job done. So we we can't use that as a rationalization. Well, Jesus can't come yet because not everyone's heard the gospel. Um, we're, we're using our own rationalization there. And he says, uh, he really says we shouldn't do that. Only he knows. It's all I'm saying. It's a it's a doctrine of, of, of a limitation of our knowledge. He's limited our knowledge. So only he knows when that time has is, has actually come. Yeah, certainly, again, we, we agree that we live in expectancy of the Lord's return. We could debate yeah. if that's different than, than at any moment idea. Uh, let me just press this last point again in the, in the time that we have. Um, 2 Thessalonians 2, and again, I will categorically dispute the uh, apostasia discussion, but it does say that the day of our gathering to him cannot happen until the apostasia happens and the man of sin is revealed. Can you explain to me in a, in a minute, exegetically in Greek, why you separate those two things and say, first the apostasia, and then when we're gone, the man of sin? Because Paul says it won't, this won't happen, our gathering, until these two things take place. Yeah, well, if you notice where it says the first, it doesn't say the apostasia and then, or, uh, and then, and the man of sin first. It says the apostasia first, and the man of sin is revealed. Uh, I'm not a Greek scholar, but, uh, you know, from my reading, I think... Um, is it Thomas's commentary? He says it could be re read both ways. He could say both events have to happen first before, but you could also read it as that apostasia at first, uh, and the, and then as the first event of the day of the Lord, then um, the man of sin is revealed, and that agrees with Revelation six, which where the antichrist is revealed as the first event in the tribulation. So it is possible either way, to, to read it either way grammatically. Now going to transition to our concluding statements. Five minutes are allotted to each of you for uh, tying all the strings together and making a final statement. Uh, Pastor Walker, you will go first. Second Peter 1.19 says, We have the prophetic word confirmed, which you all do well to heed as a light that shines in a dark place until the day dawns and the morning star arises in your hearts. This describes three lights of God. 
In this present time, we have the light of his prophetic word shining in our hearts. And Peter says we must live by that word until the day dawns and the morning star rises in your heart. And this speaks of two future different manifestations of Christ's glory parallel to the sunrise and the appearing of, a morning, of the morning star. Sunrise, of course, is a picture of Christ in his second coming when he'll rise upon the whole world and all will see him in his glory. Malachi describes the return of Christ as the rising of the son of righteousness, radiating the earth with his glory, bringing in the new day, the millennium. But shortly before the dawn, while it's still dark, another light rises into view called the morning star. It's actually Venus. And it appears as one of the brightest stars heralding the coming dawn. It signifies the sun will soon rise and the new day begin. It only appears to those awake and watching. And so it is a manifestation to true believers only. All will see the sun, but only some will experience the morning star. After the morning star, the world remains in darkness for a time before the sun rises in glory. And so likewise, Christ, our morning star, will appear first to those who are ready. And then he will appear as the son of righteousness to bring in the new day when all will see him in his glory. In Revelation twenty-two sixteen, Jesus said, I am the bright morning star. So the morning star is a manifestation of the glory of Jesus. And in Revelation 2, 28, he promised believers, I will give him the morning star. So this is a special future manifestation of his glory given only to believers. I believe these are romantic words of love. He's saying as the bridegroom to his bride, I will give you myself. I will fill you with my glory. And Peter says that the morning star will arise in your hearts. So this is a manifestation of Christ's glory that originates from within the hearts of believers where the Holy Spirit dwells. So while the world is asleep in the darkness before sunrise, when all will see his glory, there'll be a special manifestation of his glory given to believers only. He will appear to them as the morning star and his glory will arise in their hearts. So the morning star is the promise of the glory of Christ manifested to believers and in believers in the rapture before the second coming. So at the rapture, Jesus will release his glory and resurrection power from within us, Christ in us, the hope of glory. And that will transform our bodies and we will rise to meet him. And that same power that raised Jesus from the dead, the Holy Spirit's already in our spirit. And on that day, Jesus will give the command, releasing the morning star glory to surge out of our spirits through our hearts, transforming our bodies from mortality to immortality. And that's the manifestation of the morning star. And it will happen to us in the rapture. And the awesome thing is it could happen to us at any moment, suddenly, without warning, in the twinkling of an eye. This is the precious truth of imminence which is only upheld by the preacher of rapture. In fact, the fact that Christ could come suddenly at every, any moment so we could be instantly transported to be with him adds extra motivating power to our blessed hope because it's human nature to focus on what's imminent. For example, if someone very important to you tells you they plan to visit sometime, but not for a few months, then yes, that will motivate you. But how much more if they tell you they might come at any time? That boosts your expectancy, it adds urgency to your preparations, making sure that you and your house are ready. And so likewise, believing in the imminent hope and return of Jesus adds fuel to our hope. And imminency is a major theme of the New Testament. Jesus said, watch for you don't know when your Lord is coming. Be ready for the Son of Man is coming at an hour you do not expect. Uh, watch therefore and pray always that you may be counted worthy to escape all these things that will come to pass and stand before the son of man luke 12 let your waist be girded and your lamps burning and you yourselves be like men who wait for their master when he will return from the wedding that when he comes and knocks they may open to him immediately blessed are those servants whom the master when he comes will find watching and james says be patient brethren till the coming of the lord establish your hearts for the coming of the lord is at hand do not grumble against one another brethren lest you be condemned behold the judge is standing at the door uh, and titus says uh, paul says to titus looking for the blessed hope and the glorious appearing of our great God and Savior. So let's be awake and let's be, make sure we're ready to meet the Lord, loving him and serving him with all our heart, for he could come at any time. Let's eagerly watch, look and wait for his imminent return. Thank you, Pastor Walker. Dr. Brown, you now have five minutes for your closing remarks. Again, thank you, Pastor, and, and thank you for your love for Jesus and spurring us to look forward to his return. First Thessalonians 5, now concerning the times and the seasons, brothers, you have no need 
to have anything written to you, for you yourselves are fully aware that the day of the Lord will come like a thief in the night, while people are saying there is peace and security, then sudden destruction will come upon them as labor pains come upon a pregnant woman, they'll not escape. So the times he's speaking about to us are the times when sudden destruction come on the world. But you are not in darkness, brothers, for that day to surprise you like a thief. If you're all children of light, children of the day, we're not of the night or of the darkness. So the way that we avoid being overtaken and the day coming like a thief is by living lives in love with Jesus, walking in light, walking in purity, walking in holiness, as opposed to constantly looking over our shoulders at a prophetic calendar that you have to keep in pencil because it's changing constantly. When I came to faith in 1971, How Lindsay's Late Great Planet Earth was the bestseller. Everything was laid out. Everyone saw the time is short. We're out of here any minute. And I have watched generations of people abdicate responsibility in society thinking, we're out of here any minute. Every time there's bad news in the society, what do they think? This is it. It's all going down from here. I've seen it bring spiritual irresponsibility. I've seen it bring hopelessness because rather than saying, hey, we are here to make a difference until he comes and no matter how bad things get, we will overcome. It does produce an unhealthy escapism. We have to live ready to meet Jesus at any moment because any of us could die. That we know is a certainty. Uh, I would press categorically that in 2 Thessalonians 2, 3, that when Paul says the apostasia must come first, that all Greek evidence for a 400-year period, 200 years before Jesus, 200 years after Jesus, does not have a single attestation of that noun, meaning physical departure. It always means a rebellion or a spiritual rebellion. Even the early uh, translations, English translations, that translate it with departure, like Geneva Bible, they explain what they mean, a departure from the faith. That's why all reputable modern translations translate with rebellion or apostasy. That's why all leading Greek lexicons, I'm talking about the scholars of the scholars, put that as the meaning for 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 3. And again, the parousia is an actual arrival. Once again, we're not looking for a parousia followed by a parousia, an epiphania followed by an epiphania, an apocalypse followed by an apocalypse. We're looking for one second coming. Oh, and by the way, the last trumpet really is the last trumpet. It's not followed seven years later by another trumpet. There's the last trumpet, and then after that, a trumpet. No, this is not some confusing system. And, and that's why early church testimony, study it out overwhelmingly. One after another after another. They talk about the church being here during the time of the Antichrist. They talk about time of suffering. The second coming is always— a, a, for, I'm talking about citation after citation after citation reviewed in great detail by scholars. You say, well, I heard one possible reference here. Read everything. You'll see that one possible reference disappears. Second Thessalonians 1, what we're waiting for, the appearing, the revelation. Is that how Paul describes it? The revelation? When is that? When he comes in flaming fire to destroy the wicked. That's what we're waiting for, his glorious appearing. Even so, come, Lord Jesus. When he comes, there is one second coming. And I challenge Pastor Walker to teach this just using the consistent biblical vocabulary from the Greek. It becomes meaningless gibberish. The day of our gathering to the Lord will not come until first there is rebellion, the apostasy, the man of sin is revealed, whom Jesus will destroy with his coming, the coming that we are awaiting. And again, we know that first believers did not believe in any moment return of Jesus when they said, will you restore the kingdom at this time? No. What does he say? You receive power. The Holy Spirit will come on you. You'll be my witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, to the uttermost parts of the earth. Revelation 7 speaks of a people from every language, every tribe, every tongue. So we burn to see that completed. Yes, we leave the exact timing to the Lord, but we burn with eagerness to see that completed, understanding that the fullness of the Gentiles must come in, Romans 11. 25, and all Israel will be saved, Romans eleven twenty six, 26. And Paul says in Romans 11, 11 through 15, that the turning of Israel to the Lord is the final event that brings him back. So with great expectation, I look forward to being with Jesus forever. With great expectation, I burn and long to see his return in my lifetime. Even so, come quickly and we will glorify you until that one and only second coming.